Welcome to the Books Cafe, your literary program on KBC English Service. I'm your host, Kainga Okwemba. The Books Cafe is a cutting-edge program in the world of literature. In this program, we talk to writers and explore contemporary literary issues. In the program today, we are privileged to have a Professor Chris Wanjala, one of Kenya's foremost literary critics and scholar. Professor Chris, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Mr. Hainga. Now, Prof, you teach at the University of Nairobi, but you are better known as a critic. What does it take for one to become a critic? Well, uh, uh, one has to go through the educational mill. In fact, uh, perhaps when you go to school, you don't know what you'll be in the future. And especially at the time I went to school uh, in the 60s and uh, a good part of 70s, I only realized that uh, I was going to be a literary critic when I joined the University of Nairobi uh, in 1968. But even though, even then, when I did my first year, I mean my the first semester, what I knew was that I was just a, a good student of English. I loved poetry, I, li- I, I loved uh, fiction, and uh, I loved drama. Well, for me, it, I didn't have that level of a, a literary critic at the time. I was just a student of literature. So what I, I, I could say is that uh, to be a literary critic, uh, one has to start uh, as a lover of literature, a student of literature, and ultimately uh, a practicing uh, debater on books as they arrive and uh, on issues literary as they emerge in the public domain. Well, thank you so much, Prof. Now, of course, uh, uh, I read something a while ago in a journal that there was this uh, scholar at the university, Adrian Rusko. And uh, yeah, Adrian Rusko actually got you into the, the realm of literary criticism. If you could just revisit that path, how you began. Uh, Adrian Rusko uh, was a British scholar uh, who was a lecturer at the University of Nairobi. I think he joined the university around 1968 as a lecturer. And he had just finished his PhD on Nigerian literature. Uh, he had studied uh, writers like Wole Shoinka, J.P. Clark, Gabriel Okara, and so on. And when he came uh, to East Africa, he had a lot of interest in publishing and also discovering new writers. So he launched a journal called uh, Nexus. Later, the journal changed its names many times, but he was the editorial advisor of this journal. So in the process, he is the one who actually initiated me into uh, literary criticism. Because when I joined as a first year, uh, he challenged me to uh, review Mbiti's poems, poems of nature and faith, and uh, also to review uh, Joseph Brugger's uh, a poem called The Abandoned Heart. So that was my very first attempt at uh, literary criticism, and he challenged me to uh, actually write that essay, and he published it in Busara, the journal where he was uh, the editorial advisor. And uh, since we interacted so well, uh, during the holidays, as a student, I never went home. So again, he arranged for me to work with a, a publishing house where I was helping uh, young writers to get published. Now that you are just a new student at the University of Nairobi, and then you found yourself now beca- becoming a literary critic, yes. having published that first uh, essay on poetry. That's right. Now, eventually, you became a critic. Uh, ultimately, I in the same department, uh, I was uh, elected to become the chairman of the writer's workshop in the department when I was a second-year student. And uh, that writer's workshop meant that uh, I prepare materials from young writers around campus. At that time, there were no computers. Uh, we only used uh, manual typewriters. So I stencil those uh, works, and then I call a meeting of uh, young readers in one of the social halls at the university, and uh, we began actually analyzing those literary materials. Then eventually, even the lecturers used to join us in the evening. You know, even the head of the department was at that time Professor uh, Andrew Gar. And uh, interestingly, even uh, journalists like uh, Philpo Cheng and uh, the late Alo Ojuka began coming to our halls of residence to attend our literary events. So I became a kind of weekly critic of materials from fellow students at the university. Of course, later on, you would belong to that very exceptional league of Abiola Ilere and Louis Nkosi. Abiola from Nigeria, West Africa, and Nkosi from South Africa, and you emerging as a pioneer literary critic from East Africa. So if 
we were to look at some of the books or writers that emerged, your contemporaries, the ones that are, we could look at as canonical books in that period, because that is the period that we always want to relate to as having giving us the first books by Africans. Uh, at the time, uh, I was sort of getting engaged because after my undergraduate studies, I joined uh, the department as a, an assistant lecturer. With my first degree, I began teaching. And uh, then after that, I got involved, in fact, in editing a book called Standpoints on African Literature. And this book uh, contained essays from fellow students and also uh, lecturers in the department. And I was even able to get uh, contributions from uh, Uganda, from such uh, uh, critics as uh, Peter Nazareth. So in a way, my pioneer, pioneer work was uh, The Season of Harvest, which is a, a response to uh, Taban Lolyong's uh, The Last Word. Because Taban argued that uh, there is a literary barrenness in East Africa, but I argued that there was a season of harvest where new titles were coming, and maybe Taban was just being deaf to the idea that, in fact, we were flourishing uh, as, a, as a, a region. So with that kind of debate, in fact, I first met uh, Louis Nkosi at a conference in Kampala in around 1973, and uh, we began to relate very well. We became instant friends. Later, we were meeting internationally overseas. And Abiole Rele also passed by. And there is a, a literary critic from Nigeria called uh, Kole Omotosho, who published an article in uh, Afriscope, a journal that was published in uh, Nigeria. And uh, I was very delighted. In fact, Ngugi, was, Ngugi and I were very delighted when these critics put me at par with uh, Irele and uh, Louis Nkosi. It was just a pleasant surprise. But in any case, afterwards, again, the three of us met in uh, uh, Frankfurt in uh, Germany and it was so good uh, Irele representing West Africa and Kosi South Africa and I uh, representing East Africa it was uh, a, a, a moving I mean uh, quite an experience for me I'll take you back when you say that in fact when Taban Lo Leong Professor Taban Lo Leong the Sudanese South Sudanese scholar made that uh, that claim that there was a literary barrenness that you actually wrote a book responding to that. But how come that he was allowed to run away with that statement and it has defined the, the East Africa for a very long time? One thing is quite clear. Taban Lolyong made that claim when he was still a student in Iowa. He was a student uh, of uh, fine arts, which includes uh, literature, music, and dance. And uh, he says in the last word that uh, when they were having a tutorial with writers from South Africa, from West Africa, uh, West Africans were able to enumerate very many writers, including Amos Tutuola, uh, Wole Shoinka, Chino Achebe. But when he was called upon to talk about East African writers, uh, he says uh, they were very, uh, there was only Whipnot Child. I mean, only Ngugi's uh, one novel was on the market. So he began lamenting from uh, America that uh, there was a... Lit he wrote a poem, in fact. It was not even a literary essay. It was a, a poem lamenting the scarcity of publishing in, uh, in East Africa uh, around 1965. And you can, uh, of course, agree with him that uh, during that time, there were very few uh, works published by uh, East Africans. But critics have tried to... Uh, Sure, apart from my season of harvest, even Okot Bebitek has said uh, uh, Taban Lolyong was suffering from literary deafness because he was not even listening to the songs from the countryside. And Okot Bebitek himself, in the introduction to Horn of My Love, talks about Taban Lolyong's deafness. Yeah, in fact, in fact, he, he said that he went along to collect that collection of songs, um, um, folk songs, to say that there was literature, not necessarily what... Uh, the one that Taban Lord Young was trying to define. Yes. In fact, uh, uh, he showed that uh, Taban Lord Young's definition of literature was uh, biased towards only written literature. Yes. But uh, we have vast, vast, you know, oral literature in the countryside. But I think Taban, his statement was also useful to us because he challenged us. Because uh, he was one of my... Uh, the people who attended my writer's workshop at the University of Nairobi. When you were still a student. When I was still a student. And he challenged the students, I mean, people to write. Because he was the only 
a literary scholar who had been trained in creative writing because other people were being trained to be literary critics. He was trained as a, as a, an artist, a performing artist. So there is a way in which, uh, uh, like if you are a musician, then you, you train other musicians. So Taban was like that and very aggressive at that. Uh, because I, t- I remember him one, in, during one of my workshops challenging Everett Stander uh, to write originally, you know, <laughs> which was very good. You are listening to The Books Cafe, your literary program on KBC English Service. And in the studio, we have Professor Chris Wanjala, one of East Africa's uh, celebrated and pioneer literary critics. Now, Prof, there's uh, something that is happening today in the literary expositions in Kenya and in East Africa. And of course, you could relate it to, they say that at one time, Nairobi was a melting point of culture where we had all these literary scholars from Nigeria, South Africa, Uganda coming to Kenya. But then those ones were different because at least after those events, there were moments that were defined, you know, statements made by those, like, when, like for example, when Christopher Kikbo attended the conference in East Africa at Makerere, he said that I don't write my poetry to non-poets, you know. But, you know, and then it, he became to be de- defined as that poet who does not, his poetry was very difficult. But so many events happening today, but not not those very momentous, you know, uh, things that you could look back to and say that, ah, you know, what is happening in our literary movement today, Prof? Well, one thing is quite clear. Uh, the 1970s and 80s, uh, or 60s and 70s, that was the time of cultural nationalism where Africans were trying to answer back to, to the Western world, which had sh- argued that there was no literature in Africa. Africa had only darkness, and uh, darkness cannot be a subject of literature. Uh, so there is a way in which uh, uh, Africa was answering back, and uh, fortunately for the African writers, they were imitating uh, European writers. Because a writer like Christopher Kigbo, whom we are t- uh, talking about, he wanted to be uh, a citizen of the world, write like European writers, uh, borrowing heavily from uh, classical Greek, from Catholic, you know, Catholic, the Roman Catholic imagery, and uh, and so on, and then uh, sort of merging it with the, the you know the Igbo culture, like one of his poems where he talks of mother and daughter. Uh, to you I come uh, ne- in my nakedness. In other words, he wanted to rediscover himself uh, and so on. And also basing his uh, poetry, the movement of his poetry on classical music. So there is a way in which uh, uh, people at that period wanted to show that they had mastered Western uh, modes of composition. Now when it comes to the present uh, generation of writers, uh, they don't have that commitment that the older writers are talking about because the older writers saw themselves as uh, part and parcel of the voice that was rejecting Western culture and uh, bring about decolonization. And they saw writing as a mission. A writer was a public figure just as well as a, a politician. And uh, they met on an equal basis. And the writer must have, when he wrote, he, he, he to summon a lot of discipline so that he, he can match other writers from uh, the rest of the world. But at the moment, a writer writes one draft of a poem and is, straight they are looking for a publisher. They don't know that a poem takes a long time to perfect, uh, to make it really worth reading. There is a lot of impatience in the young writers. And uh, the young writers think that they are replacing old writers. There is no way a writer replaces another because writing must come from the individual. That individual cannot be replaced by another. So if a writer says, oh, I'm uh, so-and-so, I'm replacing Gugi or I'm replacing or caught. That's a lie. You should work, burn your own candle, and excel. 
So I, I think there is a, a lack of discipline and lack of commitment uh, in the new generation of writers. I'm not saying that. Uh, uh, I'm not trying to say that our period was a golden period, a golden age, but I'm just saying that uh, we were fighting, and to fight you must be committed. You must be armed with the words. You must be uh, armed with the content. Now, when I look around at uh, the writers, uh, say in the 90s and uh, uh, 2000s, there's a way in which uh, uh, we are produ producing materials that have not been properly edited, they have not been properly prepared, and uh, they have not, uh, writers do not share the materials with uh, fellow critics, with critics, so that uh, the material comes out neatly. That's why you don't find most of these materials in the curriculum. KIA will not just uh, accept slipshod manuscripts or publications. Much as uh, the writers be thumb their chest and say, we, we know we are contemporary writers, but you don't find their books on the syllabus. Why? Because the discipline of production is not there. And uh, in any case, I think a writer chooses an area. If, say, you are in the realm of uh, psychological analysis of your characters, you excel in that uh, area. If uh, you want to choose public themes, like economic poverty, eradication, and all that, you must also excel in terms of content, not just style. Um, so, and there's a lot of self-publishing. -pub Somebody just deals with a printer. I don't want to name uh, some of the books, but if you read them, you find there are a lot of, so many typographical mistakes, uh, stylistic, uh, you know, flaws, and so on, which means that uh, uh, writers are not working properly with editors. We, sh we should not ignore editors because editors are like midwives. If you want to give birth to a good baby, you need a midwife. And uh, that is what editors are there for. So the writers lack discipline and even some of the editors are careless. That's why we're having a few problems. Oh, Prof, uh, now, as a critic, you also are a historian, you know, a spokesperson of your contemporaries, of your generation. For somebody who is coming to East Africa, what are some of the books that defined those moments that you tell them to read? Even the youngsters who are, who are interested in literature today, what are some of those very good books and writers from East Africa from that generation? Well, uh, one thing I, I must say that uh, uh, the content of our literature has been changing according to uh, our socioeconomic situation. For example, during the uh, the early period, uh, Ngugi came up with uh, books like The River Between, Whip Not Child, and A Grain of Wheat. Uh, some of those early books are still worth reading. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, A Grain of Wheat. It's a very accomplished novel in terms of style and uh, management of characters and so on. Uh, Ngugi became a bit of a propagandist afterwards. So his later writings, it's as if he's putting his uh, thumb in the scale to tilt it so that the reader... But in the earlier works, like A Grain of Wheat, uh, is more balanced and is, uh, as an artist, he's controlled. And uh, maybe that's why uh, his winning of the Nobel Prize might take time because uh, he has to sort of... Uh, uh, detoxicate himself so that he, he remains an artist, not a, a, a political uh, commentator or a propagandist. So I would recommend still uh, a work like A Grain of Wheat to, to, to a reader who arrives. Now, uh, there is also uh, Major Mwangi. Major Mwangi is a very, very good storyteller. Uh, his art of storytelling is first class. He does not interfere with his tale, so, so to speak. So, uh, works like, uh, you know, the carcass, you know. The carcass of wounds. Yes. Uh, 
is readable and uh, even kill me quick <laughs> which is uh, about uh, our urban setup here when it comes to women writers uh, there is the late uh, margaret ogola uh, the river and the source uh, she sort of placed her novel in the in a historical perspective in a kind of there is a way in which african culture is also coming out People may argue that she's a feminist because she kills <laughs> all her male characters and uh, her female characters will always survive. Well, that is her standpoint, but the, the novel still uh, is worth reading. Another writer is uh, uh, Rebecca Njaro. Rebecca Njaro is, uh, compares very well with the best head of South Africa because she moves, she enters the, the mind of the characters. And she brings out the, the fears and aspirations of her characters. And you move with her into the mind of the writers and of the characters. And she has the ability also to situate publishers, I mean writers, in a very, very interesting environment. So again, uh, we have very good uh, women writers. Uh, to Also, I mean, Coming to Bath by Marjorie Oluwede Magoe is a first-class uh, novel. Of course, uh, uh, Marjorie Olude Magoye is uh, a kind of historian, and she chronicles the contemporary history of Kenya very well in that novel. But I also must say that uh, the young writers, uh, like the, the, the young writers who won the BAT Award for, for Literature recently, uh, uh, Tony Anthony Mugo, with his novel called Never Say Never. Uh, it is exploiting an area uh, of education that we have not uh, uh, dealt with. Uh, very few of us talk about the approved school. We don't know what goes on in the approved school. So in his story called Never Say Never, he deals with a young man who goes to an approved school and he actually succeeds in uh, transforming and becoming uh, a very able student, which I think is a very unique area. And uh, one must also mention uh, uh, writers of, uh, I mean, who started writing in the 70s, like Henry Rufus Ole Kulet. Uh, he started off with a novel called Is It Possible? In other words, is it possible to hold a book in one hand and a spear in another. Uh, he's a Maasai writer from Narok, and uh, his stories have been translated into many languages, and they really uh, uh, portray the Maasai culture, contemporary culture, very, very well. So uh, Kenyan literature is actually moving. And then in the field of poetry, uh, we have uh, people like Jared Angira, who started off to imitate Christopher Kigbo. So Jared Angira is not very accessible to uh, many readers. But there are new uh, writers, like uh, Hainga Okwemba himself, who are actually now uh, working very closely with the fellow prose writers and a new tradition of poetry which is accessible is emerging. And it compares very well with what is happening like in Latin America, you know, simple style, uh, partaking of na the natural environment, but communicating messages. Uh, so it is uh, it's not a literary barrenness anymore. Uh, the season of harvest has continued. Now, Prof, uh, that was uh, such a, a very historical perspective. Of course, when we look at... Uh, uh, us, the younger generation of Kenyan writers or East African writers would still want to associate that period, your period as the golden age of, your, um, of, of our literature. Now, coming now to our age, of course, you said you are once quoted as saying that a literary critic 
He's a spokesperson of his generation. Of course, I can speak, I interact so much with the, most of these young writers from Kenya, Binyavanga of Kwani, Tony Mochama, uh, Sitawa Namwalie, um, Shalja Patel, uh, Ngwachi Lomawio. All these are young Kenyan writers, but apparently there's not anybody who has done a complete study of these writers so that anybody coming can actually place Tony Mochama, for example, is is written three books. Place him, they say that this is what Tony stands for. This is, you know, his voice, where is it? It seems like, for me, I don't th- can literature actually grow without criticism? Literature, uh, especially good literature, grows alongside good literary criticism. And uh, I want to say, uh, if you look at the career of uh, uh, critics like uh, Louis Nkosi, Nkosi uh, did not go to anyone's uh, university for all the years. He was a journalist. He began writing his uh, criticism, uh, or rather, he, he, he began working with the, with the drum magazine when he was 19 years old. And the only time that uh, he went to a university was when he went to Harvard for about three months. And then he wrote his book called Home and Exile. But Nkosi grew side by side with writers through radio interviews like the one we are doing now because he worked in the transcription center in London and he met most of the African writers by interviewing them uh, in in England and he attended many, many conferences. Uh, So he was constantly engaged. Uh, He was not an armchair critic. A critic who makes literature grow is not somebody who sits in the uh, in the library and uh, in the classroom and discusses literature is somebody who is, I mean, the hands-on kind of job, like what we are doing now. This is uh, shaping the mind of the public about literature, and it is also improving taste. So there are only few people that I would name as critics in Kosi because he was, academic credentials aside, he was a practicing writer, a uh, he wrote about literature every day, every week, and so on. And he engaged in uh, discussions. Some writers may have called him names and all that, but he was doing his job as a critic. Uh, Kenneth Watene, when he was uh, working uh, uh, associated with the Kenya National Theatre, he uh, succeeded in commenting on literature on a weekly basis. So what you are doing now, and what you are, by working with fellow writers to comment on their works, that is healthier than somebody who sits uh, in some study and comments on uh, some classic, you know, Shakespeare or Chaucer. You are listening to the Books Cafe, your literary program on KBC English Service. I'm your host, Kainga Okwemba, and in the studio we are privileged to have pioneer literary scholar and critic, Professor Chris Wanjala. Prof, your last words. Now, where do you place Kenyan literature? Kenyan literature is versatile. Uh, We are moving. We compare very well with uh, West Africa and South Africa. And I think that uh, we are competing very well. Uh, You know, if we look around, we know that those are our only threats, i.e. West Africa and and, uh, South Africa. Kenyan literature is doing very, very well. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Prof. Uh, uh, I hope next time when we invite you to the studio, you'll come and shed more light because there are so many things that you would have spoken about, uh, literary prizes, how they shape the growth of literature. We, we, we've not talked about that and uh, so many other things. But thank you so much, Prof. Uh, I was your host, Hainga Okwemba, and uh, my producer, or the program's producer, was Jared Domboi. Till next time, thank you. Query.